Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Nordic Tourism Collective webinar, our collection of source market webinars. And today we're delighted to focus on the market of China. Um, and we're delighted that our, our um, host for the webinar on the platform is ETOA. So thanks very much to them for their support on this one. Um, we're going to be um, talking very much and bring you the latest update of what is happening in China, in the Chinese market. And in around 30 minutes, we'll give you details of a European recovery initiative for the Chinese outbound market, which is organized by Europass in conjunction with the European Travel Commission and ETOA. And it's a fantastic opportunity for DMOs, cities and destination in the Nordics to be one of 20 in Europe targeted for the Chinese market as the recovery starts. So we're looking forward to that. But we're now going to focus on the Chinese market and, and a very nice update for you with our experts. Over to you, Andy. Hi, uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Uh, we're delighted to be joined by our guest panelists today, who um, so representing Nordic Friend. Nordic Friend is a full service digital marketing and communications company with offices in Beijing and Shanghai, as well as Helsinki, Stockholm and Oslo. And joining us today, we have Rixin Jiang, CEO of Nordic Friends. So welcome to you, Rixin. <coughs> Europass is a digital communications agency and payment provider, working with WeChat, Weibo, Alibay, and Baidu, targeting the Chinese FIT market. And with us today is Damien Cochleon, head of the Nordics at Europass. And finally, Time Travels is a Finland-based travel agency specializing in group travel to Scandinavia, Russia, and the Baltics. Its main markets are international students and incoming travel from Asia. And joining us today is the co-founder of Time Travels, Zhang Xian. Uh, so welcome to all three of our panelists. So I guess we'll kick off. Um, everyone wants to know what's going on in China. What is the current situation? We saw some very encouraging signs with the return to domestic tourism in May, and everyone started to get very excited about the prospect of international travel once more. But now we read of new outbreaks and this initial bubble of optimism seems to have burst. So what is going on? What's the situation today? Perhaps, Rick Singh, we could start with you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's my great honor to be here. Um, so I'll share my screen with just two slides that I prepared uh, for showcasing about the current situations in China. I'll just share my screen right now. Yeah, first of all, the coronavirus situation. Uh, China had the outbreak actually months or weeks ahead of other parts of the world. So what we can uh, see here in China is that the turning point appears in China also earlier. So around March, uh, the situations in China about the coronavirus is pretty stabilized. So the local businesses and domestic traveling has been gradually recovered from that time. So if we look at right now, the first day of July, uh, the domestic recovery has already been uh, happening for a few months. So March of Tanks marks the Chinese president visiting the epidemic center uh, city Wuhan. So from now then, the total cases has been stabilized around 80K. So afterwards, there are still new cases, but mostly imported cases from uh, foreign countries to China. And another thing is that you might have read that in recent uh, weeks that there's a kind of a second wave of domestic cases in the capital city of Beijing. Uh, there are about 300, 320 new cases from June the 11th, uh, but it's mostly only within several uh, zones and districts in Beijing city and is very strictly controlled right now for most other parts of the world uh, it's not affecting that much. Uh, I'm right now based in our Shanghai office and the overall situation has been eased and stabilized for a few months already. And regarding the travel industry, I have some updates to share with you guys. Um, the first thing is that Chinese borders has been closed for foreigners from March the 28th and it hasn't been changed from uh, that time. Uh, and 
people have read it from today that EU borders are planning to reopen for some key or from some uh, countries of origins that the tourists might uh, visit EU countries. Uh, but China is somehow on the list, but conditionally that EU is, is expecting China to allow uh, Europeans to visit China uh, like at the same time. And only after that, the EU border will uh, open to China. Uh, it's actually two things to consider. One is that uh, EU is actually recognizing the stabilization and the containment uh, efforts in, in China. So it's pretty safe, uh, at least for European Union, to think that Chinese, vis Chinese tourists can travel again uh, to EU countries. But another thing is that this policy is also uh, depending on how China is opening the borders for EU, that it's not a certain thing to say when this mutual agreement is going to happen. Uh, for international flights, there is a 5-1 policy for international flights arrangements uh, in China that one Chinese airline can open, can only operate one route to one country in one week, not only to one city in this one country. Uh, the major Chinese airlines, including Air China, China Eastern, China Southern, and Junyao Airlines, have been nonstop operating the flights even during the worst times of the outbreak. Uh, Air China is flying to Stockholm and Copenhagen uh, once a week. Uh, Junyao Airlines is flying to Helsinki or once a week. Uh, other airlines are also flying to uh, major European destinations like London, uh, not London, but uh, Paris, Amsterdam, uh, and uh, some other uh, uh, cities. Uh, in this past two weeks, some European airlines uh, and international airlines are also announcing their reopening to uh, China uh, after a few months of pause, uh, including Lufthansa flying from Frankfurt to Shanghai, Air France from Paris to uh, Shanghai, and also Virgin from London to Shanghai. So we are definitely seeing more international flights happening between China and, and Europe. Uh, but on the other hand, opening the borders of EU and with more international flights uh, flying again, it's a positive message, but not necessarily mean that Chinese tourists will you know, very soon go back visit Europe, uh, in, in, for example, in the summertime. So it, there are still other things to consider, and I guess we'll uh, go through them later uh, with uh, Damien and, and, and Xiang. Uh, another thing is that for B2B sales, uh, Chinese government have a ban on outbound group travel product sales from the very beginning of the outbreak, uh, and that's uh, still having the ban. Uh, but if you are, you know, uh, Talking about both group travels and FIT travels, uh, the group travel ban on these uh, product sales is something to consider for sure when we talk about the reactivation. Um, on the other hand, domestic travel markets has been recovering kind of quickly in China. Last weekend is Chinese traditional festival of Dragon Boats Festival. Uh, in the three days holidays, there are almost five, uh, 50 million Chinese tourists visiting domestically in China. It is increasing a lot compared to the April uh, Tomb Sweeping Festival, but uh, still almost 50% less than 2019. But at least in China, there are some positive uh, messages that the domestic travel markets are recovering. So that's for now from my part for uh, some updates on travel industry in China to share with you guys. And I will uh, Stop sharing the slides and leave the floor to Damien and Xiang. Thank you very much, Rickson. That's that's great. Um, interesting, um, the reciprocal arrangement between the EU and China. Uh, we'll see how that develops. Um, Damien, um, Damien's with us, but we can't see him because he's on, a, he's on his phone. He's got some video problems. So Damien, perhaps if I could ask you, obviously uh, Europass's focus is primarily on the FIT business. So um, that's that's pretty much your market. Uh, what's your sort of feeling about the, the situation currently and, and how you see it in the short term? Um, well, first of all, I've agreed on uh, everything that uh, Rixin just said, just mentioned. Um, what is very interesting, and I'm quite new in the industry, uh, so I've been reading extensively to prepare for the webinar today. Um, my, my understanding is um, 
The 50% capacity that has been mentioned is absolutely what needs to be correct. It shows great uh, resilience, but not full capacity yet. Um, our estimate is that we will come back in full capacity in April 2021. That's what we think. Uh, with, of course, some milestones. Uh, the first one will be the, uh, the Golden Week, uh, 1st of October, to the 7th of October. And then, of course, the Chinese New Year next year. So that, that's one, 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 one aspect of the things. The, the second aspect, um, I think there are some major trends uh, or major changes uh, that uh, we are witnessing in, on who is traveling or who is going to travel. Um, the travelers are much younger. I think I read like uh, one third, uh, two thirds of the Chinese ready to travel are below 34. So they're quite young. Um, the way they travel um, is much more FITs, as you mentioned, than groups. And they are much more into self-guided tours. And in terms of destinations, um, they are looking for um, safety, uh, both you know, for health, but also Chinese friendly environment and also nature and well-being. So that's a major trend we are, we are looking at. And that's a very strong um, advantage uh, for our region, you know, the Nordics, because this is exactly what we can offer to the, to the clients. So that's, that would be my, my first comments. Okay, thank you, Damien. Interesting. Uh, we'll go on to, um, we'll talk about a little bit about initiatives to jumpstart the, the FI2 business uh, shortly when we talk about the, uh, the uh, Europass ETC uh, tour initiative. But uh, perhaps I can ask, um, Chiang, um, a couple of questions. You're based in Finland and you um, primarily deal with group business. Have you, um, are you still receiving inquiries uh, at the moment um, for, for the future? How, what's, what, what's the situation up there? Yes, <clears throat> so um, uh, actually we are getting uh, some inquiries, especially from Hong Kong area, uh, due to the fact that um, uh, Finnair has resumed their uh, flights uh, starting from today. Uh, three departures every week uh, in July and in August five departures then from hopefully from September and onwards then the flight will be very uh, scheduled and, and regular. So Hong Kong market I would say a little bit different than the China mainland since this five one is strictly applied but uh, we, we do see some wholesalers uh, like Huoni they are sending us some uh, inquiries for the upcoming winter and there's some specific uh, demandings uh, for the tourist bus, for example, that they request uh, every customer can uh, have to have like two free seats in order to keep some distance even on the bus. So uh, we, we see some some uh, new trend or, or new demandings uh, in or uh, in the past this uh, pandemic period. So uh, this is one, well, I would say positive thing. So the the thing is that we have to strictly follow uh, the aviation trend, like uh, which airlines start to open their departures to and back from China. So this is one hint that um, uh, we, we got a, some clue uh, which market or which key accounts that we should follow more closely. Uh, on the other side, uh, I also do believe that the first customer segments, when, when, when we're talking about the resume, once so all the restrictions are lifted are the individual travelers. Uh, as I have discussed with some local service providers in Finnish Lapland that they do see a lot of uh, booking increase from uh, FITs, from individual travelers from Europe and also from some uh, uh, Asian regions. Uh, the thing is, uh, the, the group traveling uh, from Asia uh, is little bit challenging because um, uh, Asian people like in East Asia that everyone is uh, wearing masks and this is a mandatory mandatory thing and, and in Europe is it's, it's, uh, not the same in each country so people are psychologically uh, afraid of traveling so I would say that FIT segments are uh, definitely one of the priority in among all the segments that uh, all the vendors should be really taking good care that's uh yeah that's that's uh, from my perspective well super thanks very much and uh, some very good points there and um uh just before we go on to the next question i just wanted to mention to our audience that um any questions that you would like to uh, put to our panelists please could you 
put it on the panel where it says questions there and just uh, write it down and we'll bring it up to our speakers uh, in, in a little bit later on. So that will be very much appreciated because it's so important now. We're in July, July the 1st, and um, borders are opening and uh, the most dynamic market globally, which is, has um, encountered so much and, and now recovered so much domestically, is waiting. And um, I just wanted to ask our panelists quickly, because I think so many of you just want to know this, and we've touched on it in the first question, is um, do, you, do you expect to see Chinese travelers visiting Europe this year? Are we, are we going to see some uh, uh, in Lapland in the winter period? Will we see any in the cities in Europe and in the Nordics? Um, do you feel that we, we, we can write off, let's be very open here, should we write off this year and say the international Chinese market will be traveling from next year or not? What's your thoughts on this? Uh, can I ask you, Rixin? Yeah, definitely. Um, to be honest, me myself is a business traveler. I used to visit Helsinki and the Nordics almost every month or every two months myself and, and somehow personally sharing I feel like I, I, I might not need my passport for the whole 2020. Um, so there are some predictions saying that um, the winter time might be the very 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 start of the recovery for the Nordic region from uh, welcoming Chinese tourists. Uh, it might be um, but most likely or it might also be the Chinese New Year time meaning around next springtime around February or March that the Chinese will start to travel again. Um, so following with that, I have one more slide to share with you guys that I think when we talk about this question, uh, this topic, we have to think about the segmentations of the tourists that who are traveling. Mm. Is, is sharing working? Yep, 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 okay. Yeah, so I'm just um, putting some thoughts on who are traveling as, as a Chinese tourist. Uh, when we talk about Chinese outbound tourists, one thing is the Chinese living in China and, and traveling inter, you know, for inter, intercontinental flights. Uh, another thing I would like to mention is that there are a large amount of Chinese immigrants, heritage workers and students living in Europe. Uh, they are Chinese language speakers and are using all these Chinese apps and Chinese channels. And they're also traveling. Uh, somehow these people can also be a Chinese audience when people are uh, talking about marketing or sales uh, that they can freely move in between the EU countries. Uh, some of them are somehow living in China to escape from the crisis, uh, crisis and the coronavirus. So when things getting stabilized in Europe, they might be traveling back to live and study in Europe again. So these people, these Chinese students, especially for the autumn semester, uh, might be uh, uh, traveling with inter intercontinental flights very soon. And also the Chinese immigrants, you know, nonstop living uh, in Europe for a long term can also be kind of a targeting sales group uh, if we are uh, selling something at the very first stage. Uh, another thing is that having these kind of local uh, Chinese tourists, Chinese speaking tourists in Europe can also be kind of a model and demonstration for the future recovery for Chinese uh, tourists flying from China. Because when these uh, local Chinese uh, buying products and experiencing the the post coronavirus travel products they were also post on social media and on chinese platforms saying that it is okay and safe and hygiene to travel it is a very positive message as a demonstration to the ones who are traveling from china which is the majority uh, for the business travelers i just like to mention one thing if uh, uh, anyone is, is thinking about the business traveler in china uh, 2020 marks the 70s diplomatic relationship uh, diplomatic relationship anniversary for Sweden, Denmark, and Finland. So if everything goes well without the coronavirus, we should be expecting a lot of government delegation, official visits, even from uh, organizations, schools, and universities, or state-owned businesses. But these state-owned business, government delegation, and school visits from China are all uh, state-run, 
So somehow these visits are all canceled for now, and they might be, uh, no, these business traveling might happening later than the other business travelers that they have to wait for uh, the permission from local and central government saying that it is okay to travel. Uh, other type of companies like private owned companies or international companies might be traveling uh, faster or earlier than the first category. So even within the business travelers, there are different segmentations for the Chinese market. On the other thing, for some uh, really essential business traveling, China might form some mutual agreement or form kind of a, a mutual bubble with some destinations, maybe with the whole EU or, or some European countries, we don't know. Uh, that's really depending on the government policies and the authority permissions. Right now, China is already having some kind of agreement with uh, South Korea and Singapore for uh, essential business traveling. Maybe that we can also expect some similar models for uh, Europe or the Nordics as well. For FID travelers, um, uh, I, I myself also travel a lot for leisure traveling uh, before coronavirus. So after coronavirus, I think for destinations and Nordic travel businesses, there are some things to consider when you want to do communications, marketing or product uh, reselling um, to Chinese or Asian tourists that it is safe and hygiene enough to travel, which is the top part a priority for the East Asian and Chinese tourists when, we, when you think about uh, international destinations. Uh, as uh, Xiang just mentioned, Chinese tourists and also some uh, other East Asian um, countries are suffering and, and sacrificing a lot at the very beginning of the outbreak. So people are really caring about the safety and the containment of the virus. Uh, so for international traveling, that is a top priority to convince people to travel again. And also the quarantine and testing policy might be quite different from country to country. If I have to take a 14 days quarantine to travel to one uh, country, no matter for business or for leisure, I might not travel at all. So that's really depending on how to uh, manage the quarantine and testing policy from the destination side. Flights, availability, availability, pricing, and the new convincing products are all the things to uh, communicate with the new travelers uh, again. And regarding the group travelers, as uh, we just mentioned, uh, the ban lifting from Chinese travel authority, it's something to expect. But I guess some uh, B2B trade, marketing, and sales can already happen beforehand because the Chinese tour operators might have some plans and uh, bookings before they can uh, sell in China, in the Chinese market. So they will communicate and buy the products and make the bookings uh, maybe several weeks or months ahead of the actual uh, band lifting. They will have their own predictions. So maybe, for example, if we were expecting February 20. 21 or April 2021, maybe this uh, autumn is already the time to engage and uh, talk to the Chinese B2B trade professionals and tour operators and seeing like uh, what we have to uh, prepare for the recovery. So here are something I'd like to share that if we're talking about Chinese tourists coming back, uh, what uh, the different segmentations and what to expect for the different groups. Rickson, can I just ask you a very quick question? Um, the ban on um, group travel, how is group travel defined? Uh, is it a certain number? How, how do they define that as, a, as, a, as an art concept? For Chinese visiting Europe and also many other countries are two types roughly. One is FIT, which you can travel as freely and independently. You have an mm -hmm. FIT traveling tourism visa that uh, you can arrange your own uh, travel plan freely. Group travelers, by law, it is a special visa type to visit EU. So at the very beginning, you have to buy the whole product package from a Chinese tour uh, operator or travel agency. And during the whole period of your traveling, you're not allowed to leave this group. You have to uh, stay in this group as, as a group traveler. And those group traveling sales and, and traveling are somehow uh, managed by both authorities in China and the destination, uh, 
with that visa type and, and that that legis legislation. Uh, so it's quite different, and the sales tunnels and the way that people travel together are quite different from the very beginning. Super, thanks, Rex, and uh, thanks for the presentation on that. I think you've uh, opened a lot of people's eyes, one, realistically, when we can start to expect, but also I think it was nice to pinpoint the other segments, the students, the, the business travelers, who will be traveling before our, our visitors and our travelers do, and they'll be the footprint for, for the groups and, and uh, others to follow with the, with the products in the region. So thanks very much. Um, Damien, can I ask just for a, a, a quick um, comment from you on, on when, when you're expecting, especially on a, on a Europass basis, what's your feeling in terms of uh, when um, travel? As I mentioned previously, um, we expect full recovery uh, in the spring 2021. Um, I will not completely write off 2020. I'm hoping that things can resume in October this year um, and gradually increasing toward the spring. That's what we, we expect, that's what we estimate, and that's what we're going to work for. Uh, that's, that's our best guess. Thank you. Yeah, no, it, it, it's it's realistic, uh, and uh, I think it's important that we are realistic now at this stage. So thanks, th thanks, Tim. Um, and Zhang, uh, obviously based in in Finland, and uh, with a, with a generally a normally very strong winter uh, uh, Lapland um, season. What are your thoughts for for winter? Any any slight optimism, or or how do you feel for the coming winter? So my feeling on um, like. Um, uh, the first uh, group traveling that from China come into Finland or Scandinavia uh, after this pandemic, I, I would guess is probably from Chinese New Year 2021. But uh, if any service providers that uh, you have a big percentage of B2B model, then uh, I would say it's a really good idea to really constant engagement with your current key accounts. Because in China, uh, the, the travel industry is a quite a long sales chain where probably your customers are those wholesalers for Nordic in China and the wholesalers customer are those branch travel agencies in, in different cities and those branch travel agencies, they have their own smaller, smaller sales office, which is uh, quite a long chain. And from packaging one uh, travel product, uh, I mean, after it's produced, until it's sold, it might take up to four to six months. Meaning that uh, when uh, some Chinese uh, wholesalers or travel agencies, they are aiming to have some sales from uh, Chinese New Year 2021, then they already have to prepare it from September, August, uh, September, August, uh, October. Um, so identify those accounts who are very important to you and give them the maximized, uh, your, your support and update them uh, your latest service criteria, especially during this special period. I mean, that's really important. And uh, travel agencies will also feel very empathetic uh, from your support, and, and they have more motivation to promote your products. So that's my honest suggestion for this uh, B2B business model, with, which uh, also Rishin was mentioning in his speech. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, that's very interesting. So we just we're getting a couple of questions in, but if anyone wants to ask any more questions, please do because we've got a great opportunity to speak to some real experts here. Um, we are going to um, pause slightly now because we're going to go to uh, Damien, who's going to tell us a little bit more about the um, return restart initiative, which is. Um, by the ETC, Europass, and ATOA. Um, not sure how we're going to do this because Damien's on a mobile and not on a screen. Paul, are you in control of Damien's? Ah, here we go. Absolutely. Damien, can you hear us? Yeah, but that's perfect. Okay, fine. Well, over to you, Damien. Please tell us all about this. Um, thank you, and it's a pleasure to introduce everyone to this uh, initiative. Um, briefly on Europass. Europass is um, an agency focusing on Chinese FITs based in Paris, but with offices all around the world. Um, we have clients such as uh, New York City, uh, Paris, um, Atout France, 
but also um, cities in, in Switzerland, um, Germany, and uh, also in um, Italy. We are new in the Nordics, um, and I'm in charge of all the business in the Nordics. What we do is we try to um, target, reach, and convert uh, Chinese FITs when there are destinations. What I'm going to uh, present to you now is an initiative that uh, we have worked out with the uh, ETC, backed by the ETOA, which aimed at promoting 20 destinations uh, in Europe to the Chinese FITs. Um, and I will describe to you the different elements of this um, proposal or um, recovery campaign. I will start um, first, uh, next slide please, with the deadlines, the different milestones. Um, the key thing is you need to apply as a destination before Friday 10th of July uh, at midnight. Um, and there's a link to apply that will be shared with you in the presentation. And you will see there are three or four pages in a Google Doc, which is very sim simple to fill out. And that's basically your application file. The selected destinations will be announced on Monday, July 20th, uh, which is 10 days after. Um, we hoped to have like maybe hundreds of applications. We have so far 16 um, firm uh, with major cities such as Madrid in Spain, but also Nice and Cannes in France, uh, representing six countries. It doesn't cost anything to apply, and I will explain to you the way uh, the, the mechanics of the campaign. Next slide, please. So, um, the, the way it functions um, is quite simple. Um, it's a campaign that will select 20 European destinations. These destinations can be cities, can be regions, and they can also be you know, countries. Uh, what I need here to um, insist on, some, uh, in some countries, I know already that the, uh, the country, the region, and the cities are working together. Meaning the na nation you know, um, agencies can provide some extra support and even some extra financial support, which is important to get the, um, the application. The campaign is divided in two phases. Um, the first one will go from September 2020 to December 2020. It's a digital communication based on the Chinese social media. Um, and the second campaign, the second part of the campaign story, will, uh, will start in January 2021 to March 2021, and it will be based on KOLs. So we have two phases. And then, you know, in the meantime, so once the destination will have been selected at the end of July, we will work with each destination to find the right strategy and the right uh, storyboard to achieve the, the results that we want to reach. Next slide, please. The way it is built, and you will see that in your um, application file, um, they will, we will work on the, uh, the, social, uh, the Chinese social networks, so WeChat, Weibo, Douyin, and Mafengo. Uh, we will also work with some private partners, meaning you know, hotels and airlines or railways companies. We will arrange competitions and lucky draws um, to maintain and raise the interest for the uh, European destinations. And as previously mentioned, there will be two phases. Phase one will be you know, on uh, the social media, and phase two will be on KOLs. Next slide, please. To strengthen the um, attractivity of the destinations, we have decided to work on five different clusters or five different themes. Um, and when you apply, you need to select which clusters or which themes you want to apply for. You can use different you know, um, clusters in your application. So the first cluster is art de vivre or lifestyle. It can be, for instance, uh, wine tourism and gastronomy. The second cluster or the second theme is slow adventure. So this is mostly based on nature. I'm thinking of mountains, lakes, Icelands, uh, volcanoes um, that we have a lot you know, in the Nordics. Unexpected experiences is a third cluster. Uh, here we focus mostly on creativity, on art, on the traditional flea markets, on the unexpected. The fourth cluster or the fourth team is based on local designers. Um, it can be Danish design, you know, for the, for the Danish part, but also Scandinavian designs. 
um, everything which is tailor-made, which is very special to the destination. And the fifth and last cluster is based on wellness and well-being. Um, I mean here thermal cities, countryside, spas, sauna, um, everything that we have a lot also in the Nordics. And you are welcome to apply for different clusters uh, to maximize your chance for being selected. Next slide, please. As previously mentioned, um, so we are now into the selection or application phase until the 10th of July. The results of the selection will be finished or finalized on the 20th of July. Then from the 20th of July to the end of August, we'll work with each destination on fine tuning the marketing plan. Then we will start the phase one from September 2020 to December 2020, which will be based on Chinese social media. And then from January 2021 to March 2021, we will focus on the work done with the KOLs so or the uh, Chinese influencers. There will be two influencers for each of the clusters. And each of the uh, two KOLs will spend two days for each destination. So in total, we are talking about 40 days with KOLs for the 20 destinations. And we will continue to monitor the results of the campaign until March 2022, which is one year after the end of phase two, to make sure we can reach all the KPIs that we have been committed with. Next slide. For me, this is the, uh, the very interesting part um, of this campaign. Basically, we ask you, um, each of the destinations when you apply, to be ready or to be willing to pay 10,000 euros. The uh, European Travel Commission will contribute with 10,000 extra, which means that, you know, in total, you pay 10, but you will have access to a campaign which, in reality, would have cost 20. But the beauty of it is because there will be 20 destinations, there are many synergies, there are many mutualization of costs, which means that the total value can be estimated around 50,000 euros. So all in all, you pay for 10,000 euros, but at the end of the day, you will get a campaign which has a value around 50,000 euros. Just to give some um, more details on this, um, you can work, I mean, one, one application can gather different destinations, like different cities in different, you know, um, in the same region. So that's one approach. Um, I, you can also apply, have different, you know, applications. To give you an example, I know that Nice and Cannes in France are applying separately, but they're also applying under the umbrella of the region, you know, which is the southeast of France, PACA. So there are many ways to apply for this. Um, my understanding also for the Nordic region, so from Iceland to Lithuania, we can have the ambition to reach between three and five destinations. Because what we, have, we are offering in the region is so, I would say, attuned with the expectation of the Chinese travelers that we have a high chance to meet the requirements of the selection. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of KPIs, uh, and that's also very important to, um, to notice, um, we aim at reaching 500 million views on the Chinese social networks. We also aim to have, you know, 1,500,000 interactions with the Chinese audience. And we estimate that this can generate around 50 million euros business for the tourist economy at the destinations, meaning hotel, hotel nights, transport, but also attractions. And this is based on our estimates and campaign we have previously made for um, other destinations in Europe. Next slide, please. I oh, know, not this one. <laughs> um, so to conclude, um, I will just, you know, uh, remind you the, the, the key points. First, the deadline. You need to apply by the 10th of July. That's step one. Step two, which for me, make the operation or the campaign a no-brainer. You pay 10,000 euros 
but you get a value of 50,000 euros. So that's a very unique chance. If this budget is quite high, you can gather or combine with, or you know, work with other destinations to apply. You can also have different applications within the regions, within the country, or as a standalone destination. And then we are extremely firm, you know, on the KPIs we're going to reach. I've just detailed them. And the last point is the five clusters um, that you need to mention in your application form. Also, I want to mention that, you know, um, Europass will be available to help you once you have been selected uh, to implement the campaign. You can also get the support from ETOA. And I will be most than happy to help you to make sure that we get more than five destinations for this campaign. That's it for now. Jamie, thank you very much. That's fantastic. Um, I think that's a brilliant initiative. I, I really do. I think it's really good. It shows the power of collaborative thinking. It shows the power of um, working together. Um, and it shows real imagination. So, so congrats to everyone involved in that campaign. I just have a couple of questions for you, Damien, if you're still there. Yeah. Um, there's 20 places, so it's five, five destinations throughout the Nordics. Realistic? Question mark. That's number one. Um, question number two is the, the key opinion leaders who are visiting, you say it's two per destination. How long would they typically be spending in the destination? Um, and thirdly, do you have to be a cluster to apply? So can I just be a single destination and say, yeah, I, I want to pitch in for my, with my bid? Um, question number one, three to five is extremely realistic. Mm -hmm. um, I would be even more ambitious. Uh, so I would say minimum five, uh, because I think we're the, the Nordic regions, once again, have all the assets um, to win these five destinations. Question number two is how much time with the um, KOL spend in each destination? They will spend two days in each destinations. We ask each destination to mention four attractions or four hotspots, and they will go you know, to these different hotspots when they will be a destination. There will be some kind of you know, challenges and games uh, among the KOLs, and they will be, um, I would say, motivated. There will be incentives for them to promote the destination as much as they can. So we want to have success, so that, that's also very interesting. The third issue was, uh, or the third question was about, you know, um, being a cluster or being a standalone destination. Everything is possible, meaning you can apply either as a standalone destination, let's say Göteborg, Copenhagen, Reykjavik, but you can also apply as a cluster. For instance, uh, there can be a Baltic state cluster with Riga, Tallinn, and uh, Vilnius. That's that's really to be, um, I would say, organized for each destination. If you need more details, you can contact me. And of course, you can apply both as a standalone or within a cluster. One of the constraints regarding the cluster is if you apply as a cluster, if you have four hotspots, I would say that the, uh, within the cluster, the KOL must be able you know, to travel during the two days. So we need to have this into consideration or make choice among the cities that you know make the uh, the clusters which hotspot are they going to visit okay thank you damien um just a quick question i just want one more question but i'm actually going to end this at rickson rather than you damien um the uh how important are you is using the uh, kols uh in the whole sort of chinese media and what social media this is a really important um channel that, that should be used, Rixin? What's your how does the Chinese media work? What the social the social how important is social media within the whole travel decision making process? Yeah, I think it's getting uh, more and more important as China is highly digitalized nowadays with our uh, social media ecosystem super mature and developed. So many uh, tourists uh, as well as other, some other industries are following the influencers or so called KOLs a lot on, on Chinese uh, social media channels, especially for destinations and international traveling that in, in the Chinese term is called like zhong cao, like uh, planting a, a seed, uh, planting a weed in, in your heart 
to let you know that it is actually a very nice destination to travel because people need demonstrations and models to 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 show that it's a nice place with pictures and videos and uh, personal recommendations um, and it's a very commercialized industry in china with a lot of kols so uh, the selections and, and the management process also matters a lot uh, as it, it's kind of sometimes can be really expensive and um, so uh, choosing the best kol the most suitable kol is also quite important Thanks, thanks, Rick. And just a final point from me: the um, the slides that uh, Damien shared, we'll we'll share them later to everybody. We'll send a link. So if anyone's interested in um, taking a look at that, um, then please do have a look at it. Um, and uh, if anyone's got any questions, come either back to us or come to Atoa or um, go directly to Damien at Europass. I'm sure he'd be delighted to answer your questions. Paul, over to you. Yeah, just just to 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 end it as well, uh, Damien. Uh, I understand that that you know there's no advantage of being a major city like a Paris or a London uh, or an Oslo or a Stockholm. You you can be a, a small destination, uh, a cluster of small areas. It, it's very much open to all sizes. Is that correct? Uh, fully agree. Um, size does not matter. Um, I would say what will matter. My understanding of the uh, the selection criteria is. Uh, the strategy, the consistency of the strategy and the ambition. So you don't need to be a big city to apply um, and you don't need to be a well-known destination. The key issue is you need to have, a, I would say, a clear, a unique selling proposition as a destination for Chinese FITs. Perfect. Great. Well, thank you very much. I mean, it's a fantastic initiative. Um, deadlines are very, are very, uh, very soon. So. Um, for those that are interested in the audience, uh, please um, get going on it as soon as possible. And if you've got friends, because there is a bit of a holiday period in the Nordics at the moment, if you've got friends that maybe are not aware of it, that may be interested in, in different destinations, please share uh, the presentation that we'll share with you all afterwards with them as well. That would be great. Um, just one final question that we have time for, uh, for, our, for our three panelists, um, and that is, uh, a, a, an interesting one is, is how will the Chinese travelers be booking their trips in the future when when uh, when the coronavirus is more behind us to the Nordic region? How will they be booking it in, in, in the future and what type of holiday will appeal to them? Um, can I ask this one to uh, to you, Rixin? Um I think there are a few things to consider. One is that it, it's still differs once we talk about different types of trawlers, whether they are group trawlers or FITs or luxury trawlers. Uh, another thing is that after coronavirus, I think Chinese tourists will value the safety, hygiene, uh, like also the very Nordic social distancing that is not super crowded, that people will look into those destinations uh, more. And also if there are themes of wellness, nature, uh that with clean air with with clean water with a lot of uh you know parks and and, and, and nat uh, nature resources that you know the nordics region have a lot to offer which can also be something to market pretty well uh and i think more people want uh, uh once they are looking for traveling uh, more people will book from fit uh tunnels and with families and with close friends, they can travel in small groups instead of a bigger group with strangers. So that's my, my personal impression, and, but I guess we'll keep an eye on the market trends uh, every single day. Uh, I know if, if, if Xiang has um, some more insights from the trade business side. Thanks, Rick. And Xiang, any thoughts on that one? Yes. Um... For the trade side, I mean, uh, it's, it's still quite in the in the traditional way that we communicate by you know this email and also also some booking agent booking platforms. But I would say that both for individual and uh, I mean FITs and groups for B two B B two C, these are low contact economies over the coming. Uh, I mean, low person to person contact. So digitalization is definitely one thing that every company should be really focused on that uh, uh, it can really improve your efficiency on operations and also the information deliveries. Um, so yeah, I think uh, for the trade side, 
especially uh, the digitalization and some SaaS system we can see uh, like, like this booking portal like Fair Harbor, Bookcom, and they are very active in, the, in these days. So I, I, I would say that uh, uh, the digital world is, is already there and uh, some, some uh, tradition in the industry will probably will uh, gone very soon. So, uh, but let's, let's uh, keep, in, keep, uh, keep uh, going. Uh, with both, you know, is uh, your current customers, your current way of doing business, and also keep an eye on the new trend. Yeah, I'm sure there'll be lots of uh, new new things for for us uh, in the Nordics and the suppliers to learn. And and I think the notion of smaller groups is going to be absolutely critical. I think that gone are the days where we're going to have Chinese groups of 35, 40 passengers on a coach. Uh, I think there'll be the the smaller minibus, the families, the smaller groups of, of family and friends, which will be a theme of China and probably a lot of Southeast Asia as well. I think that's something that we'll we'll be aware about. It's the same kind of workload for a DMC and an organizer to, to do in terms of um, uh, of organizing the trips, but of course there'll be more of them. So it's gonna be quite interesting how the group market develops post-corona. And Damien, the, the last bit of floor for you, um, if you've got some thoughts on uh, on uh, how the holiday maker may look uh, in the future from China and um, maybe uh, give a little bit of a conclusion on that one. Um, hmm. I think what I've seen the last month and the, this is the acceleration of digitalization. So I fully agree with this. One of the things that I've noticed is the, um, uh, the video, the production or the use of the video content and the, uh, the live streaming that are two big trends. Um, and I think, again, uh, the Nordic has a lot to offer, both as destinations, so nature, um, low density population, uh, clean air, um, hygiene, also high, you know, internet penetration. So um, this is a very promising future for all the region. And if we all work on this, well, we're going to make it and we're going to make it big. So that's very interesting. Super. I think I think you've um, made, made a very nice conclusion there, Dem. Is that, that the Nordics has a huge opportunity here um, in terms of all what we've we've discussed about um, hygiene, about space, about clean air, about nature, about looking for safety uh, in, in in the short and medium term for travelling from China. There are absolutely huge opportunities for the Nordics, and of course this initiative that um, Europass and, and ETC and Itoa are putting together is a fantastic um, platform for these destinations, DMOs and cities to, to work on. So I re we really believe that we are in a, in a positive situation moving forward. Uh, at the moment, it's very, very tough for everybody. We can hear the Chinese market is not gonna come back very strongly at all in 2020, that's been um, concluded here today. But after that, when things start coming up, the Nordics is in a phenomenal position. I think we, we should all be ready uh, for, for, for great influx from China. Over to you, Andy, to conclude. Yeah, I'd just like to wrap up as well. But before we do, I'd just like to ask Vixen one quick question. Uh, Damien mentioned live streaming. Um, could you just, for the benefit of people who don't actually know what that is and how that works in China, how that how that how that how that's done because it's quite an interesting phenomenon what what's actually takes place in live streaming that's actually have been uh, a hit on on china especially on e-commerce platforms from last autumn that people are kind of buying a lot of things from e-commerce uh, live streaming that these apps and platforms are opening the live streaming functions with the KOLs, celebrities, or professional live streamer uh, having the live streaming sessions over there directly every single day, and people then buying a lot of products from their recommendations during the live streaming session. And later on, the live streaming functions are kind of becoming a trend on the new digital marketing and communications in China and on Chinese platforms that it has also been used on uh, social media channels on uh, OTA channels, uh, for example, Fliggy uh, and, and Ctrip are also doing live streaming to sell the travel products over there. Uh, they are, for example, uh, Ctrip are sending their chairman, chairman of the board 
uh, to the Chinese destinations and uh, do live streaming and recommendations directly for multiple sessions. And Fliggy is also having uh, these global wide campaigns to recommend the, the live streaming sessions. Uh, that is a way somehow called cloud traveling for marketing messages that when people are not allowed to travel, uh, they still have to be engaged and influenced, influenced and uh, communicated that it is clean, safe, hygiene, and everything ready, for example, in the Nordics. Uh, so it's kind of a message delivering uh, during this crisis when, when international traveling is not happening very soon. Uh, but once the day that the border is opened, uh, flights are resumed, and you know people start to think about traveling, these messages they receive during these marketing masses and, and for example, live streaming will pop out in their mind and say, okay, I remember it's, well, some destination is perfect uh, choices for the recovery bills and buying. Uh, and then uh, it, it might work pretty well. Uh, but most importantly, it's a, a popular thing in China. So uh, it's, it's something that uh, for destinations might also consider if it is possible to conduct such uh, marketing efforts. So, so if I can bring things down to a more basic level, it's a sort of shopping channel which is conducted by uh, an influencer. Is that how? It, that's basically how it works. Do you remember the old days that people <laughs> buy stuff when they watch TV? That there are channels that they are, you know, selling stuff 24 hours a day. That's the one. That's like, not... Yeah, but the devices is on, 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 on mobile on, on these uh, social media platforms in China. Um, yeah. I heard Instagram or TikTok are also having live stream functions, especially during coronavirus. But I, I, I guess no other platform will will have the size and the the popularity as the Chinese platforms are having. Uh, so most importantly is that Chinese audiences and uh, internet users are kind of into it at this very moment. But I have to say I don't know how long it's my it might last. No. The Chinese landscape changing like every single month so many people get tired of it yeah, yeah. next month but at least for now it is uh one thing to consider yeah next week it might be something different altogether <laughs> but so listen thanks to everyone i mean it's been a fantastic session i've really much enjoyed it so much um very interesting thank you very much to xiang um thank you very much to rickson and thank you very much to damien for all of their contributions today, this has been fantastic. And uh, I've learned two things. One is um, um, cloud traveling is a great is a great phrase I shall use in the future. And I hope that we've managed to plant a seed in everybody's hearts today. So thank you very much. So for our panelists, thank you very much, and um, wish you a great day or a great evening wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. -bye.